Hello you and welcome to the cookery show that gives you thought for food. More wordplay later. Keep tuned. <laughs> if you like your chefs nestling on a bed of informed questioning, then I have got a treat for you. In this series, I'm joined in the studio... Flip him over. ...by some of Britain's very best chefs. This is the tightest chef in Great Britain. Ah! <laughs> Waste not, one not. Here to chew the fat... The literal stars of Michelin star. Just sit comfortably. <laughs> they like that, comfortably. really. And share knowledge. Like meat, I always say, rest your fish. Along with an audience of keen cooks here to give the chefs a grilling. Who would like to ask something? Thumbs up. How do you make the perfect steak? We'll be getting answers to all kinds of culinary questions. No, it's amazing. Yay! Oh. Well done, Jake. Thank you. And celebrating foodie knowledge, techniques... <laughs> And trends. It's just the sort of sauce that you want to lick plate of <laughs> Congratulations, you've returned a table at Cook's Questions. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're thinking. Quite nice title, Sue, but when do we meet the chefs? Well, now, actually. This marvellous man is called Jason Atherton. In the last three years, he's opened four restaurants in London. Yes, four! And if that hasn't made you feel like you've done nothing with your life, it's worth noting that two have won Michelin stars. Jason, when are you going to pull your finger out? Come on. <laughs> Slacker is the word that comes to mind with you. Uh, over here is lovely Lisa Allen. Lisa became head chef at the Michelin starred Northcote in Blackburn when she was only 23. So, you could say she's the original little chef. <laughs> Our final chef looks a bit like this. We call him by his name, Richard Corrigan. Richard's won two separate Michelin stars over the years for his cooking and is celebrated for his love of all things wild, foraged and feathered. But enough about his relationships. <laughs> now, our first question today comes from Gemma. Hello, Gemma. Hello. You all right? Yes. Don't be frightened now. <laughs> the bikini round is yet to come. <laughs> now, um, what was it that you'd like to ask our chefs? Well, I'm really fond of eating fruit de mer in France, and I'd love to know how to prepare it at home. The fruit of the sea. Jason, uh, the secret to a great fruit de mer for you? We do it at the Burners Tavern, and we just fill it. I'm, I'm lucky to travel the world and, and go to some great countries, and still Britain has the yeah. best shellfish on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. Richard, now you're going to take us through this. Do you fan fruit de mer? I love fruit de mer. It is delicious. Most people think it can be just raw, like raw oysters. Uh, clams, uh, mussels. And in France, they would probably eat a little bit more on the raw side. I think in Britain, you know, people like their shellfish cooked a little bit as well. So you can put a few cooked uh, clams on there, some cooked mussels. Yeah. The langoustines, very, very lightly cooked. The Atlantic prawns, which are delicious, by the way, very plentiful. And of course, the crab really is the centrepiece of all grey through the mares. Will we proceed? Will we? And, I think and, we should and, proceed. And, and, and show you should... you. My love. Just take the large claws off and just pull them back to the head of the crab. So you take the whole thing out together. You're getting this, Gemma? And then it's really important, instead of just fiddling, the tops of the legs, which I don't use because they tend to turn things a little bit bitter, oh. taking it in one hand, you hold the lot and then just pull the lot out in one go. Right. And you're just making it easy then to pick the crab. Now, at the back again, two fingers, thumbs, right. up the front. Oh, dear. Taking the... Like something out of Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> it's the huge. Yeah. Um... Well, just... Uh, just taking that out, and then just with your thumb again, yeah. pushing that in, just to kind of the intestinal tract. Just that's all you take out Great. of there. This is the brown crab meat here. Just pick it out really, really carefully. Get it in there. And basically, you can just put this up. Just cut it all up. Cut the body in half. And holding then in your hand the half body, just pick everything out mm. into the palm of your hand. And it really is worth picking. It might seem tedious, mm. boring, yes. monotonous, mm. but do it because you've paid a lot of money for this. Yeah, it's true. Lisa, do you serve a Frida Mare in your restaurant? Is this something that you'd happily sort of put in front of, of clients? Just give that a rub yeah, there. Yeah, we serve Frida Mare, but we do it in different ways, you know, using the, the middles to make a bisquid, which is a, oh. a classic French. Yeah. Where you take the bones and you put them down with tomato puree, a bit of brandy in there and some mm. tarragon, that kind of thing. So there's a lovely little soup as well as some potted crab on the side. So you use the whole thing? Yeah, the whole thing, yeah. Breaking the crab down at, when you come to the, the claw level, can, yes. it's, it's quite tricky. So what I'd suggest to you, if, if that goes that way, the back of your knife in there, it just knocks it off. Yeah. And what you don't want to be doing is too much kind of rolling pin work on the crab because it just splits the shell into so many different pieces. And then you get it in the meat. And then you get into the meat. And so when you're just breaking it, just... So what you're doing is get rid of the most you can. 
You can leave that hole under and transcribe. It's lovely. It's quite DIY, this whole thing, isn't it? It's got sort of... So you want to knock it up in its biggest blocks at all possible. So you can really, you can just put them just on there because the people can take care of that themselves. And then your dress crab, your brown meat in the middle. Yeah. So this is a classic way to dress crab, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You would dress it with kind of a small bit of grated egg and that's about it. Look at that. In the back. For the oysters. This yeah. is the Pacific oyster. And if you see the way I handle the oyster knife, I'm always going like that, but never into my hand. No. So if it did slip, you're holding the oyster firmly. You're going up. You're going with the tank. You're not using a lot of strength. You're just twist, open. So you're opening a little safe. And see, so you're just twisting it over then. OK, so you just shock and then you flip yeah, it, so you just presentation it. side up. And then it just, yeah, it slides off. Are you a fan of oysters? Do you serve them always in your food mayo, Jason? Oh, or? yes. I'm crazy about oysters. I yeah. love them. Cooked raw? Raw. Yeah. You have a lot to say, Sue. I think that would just fill, yeah. fill your gob for a moment, <laughs> yeah. Right. In memory of all the noroviruses I've ever had. I mean, mm. they are good. Mm. They're very delicious. So that's, I mean, the whole idea of the fruit of Mary is just fresh, 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 very fresh, fresh. fresh. Still kicking. Gemma, uh, do you think now that you'll be able to brutalise the sea in the same way that uh, Richard has so definitely done there? Yeah, probably not quite as well, but no, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. If all that seafood chat has wet your appetite, listen up. To keep bacteria at bay, shellfish must be fresh from the sea and served on ice. Native oysters procreate on the seabed from April to August, making them taste thin or milky. September marks the start of open season in the oyster calendar. Mix up your platter with raw seafood like fresh oysters and clams and cooked lobster, crab and prawns. It's time now for our weekly peek behind the pass. Two oysters, two truffles. Four beef, one good, three and a cod. Three. 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 Where we demystify and spy on the culinary wizardry of a Michelin starred chef. It's looking exactly how I wanted it. As a dazzling dish comes together. Beautiful. I absolutely adore that. This week, we're at The Square. Yeah, one, and a half, please. Please. one of the UK's very best restaurants. It's had two stars for the last 17 years and is run by one of Britain's most respected chefs, Phil Howard. OK, we're getting one campanelle, one beef, one cod. Great! OK, service There's going something in. extraordinary about seeing phenomenal raw ingredients coming into a kitchen and then having the ability to turn them into something that has the capacity to deliver great pleasure. Phil's approach to his food is very classic, based on tried and tested cookery principles. I am completely unmotivated by innovation and, and, and the quest to change things for the sake of change. I'm still very comfortable working in my old school philosophy of flavour and, and seasonality. But when there's a gimmick that gives pleasure for the palate as well as pizzazz, Phil's happy to grapple with a spot of science, as he does in his version of the classic Spanish dish, gazpacho. In Phil's gazpacho, a cold soup of blended raw vegetables, there's a beautiful pepper garnish made through a process called spherification. Spherification is the process of trying to create a sphere of liquid which has got a film of gel around it. The tiny spheres of pepper juice look just like colourful caviar and bring a whole new layer of flavour. So now we're going to make the pepper caviar. So for the pepper juice, exactly the same process for the three different peppers. Top and tail them, lift out the seeds and the pith in the middle. So we're just going to blend this. And all we then do is push them through a fine sieve. Three lovely, pure pepper juices. To turn the juices into a gel, sodium alginate, a natural seaweed extract, is added. So here is the, uh, the pepper juice with the alginate dissolved into it. And you can see it's thickening a little bit. The gel needs to be dropped into a calcium bath so a chemical reaction can turn it into caviar. Here we have a little contraption that effectively enables us to release 
about 100 droplets at a time into the solution, and the caviar will miraculously form. OK, come on. Now we're just going to rinse off with cold water the caviar. And then here we have the end product. There's the caviar. Wonderful. Soft. It's caviar. It's an extraordinary thing. Magical. OK, so. Topped off with some very nice sour cream balls and a spoonful of sour cream ice cream, the dish is done. And there it is, gazpacho, sweet pepper caviar, sour cream spheres and ice cream. It's a Spanish classic made utterly contemporary. Amaze balls. <laughs>